When you think of iconic villains in pop culture, who do you think of? Do you think of Darth Vader, Sauron, the Terminator, Norman Bates, the Joker, your mother-in-law, Thanos? Most likely you think of at least one of these fantastic villains. But why do we love these villains? For their screen presence? For their horrible yet intriguing worldviews? For their relationships with the protagonist? Simply put, these villains have tons going for them. It's hard to pinpoint what exactly makes an incredible villain on a base level. But all of these candidates fit the bill for being formidable threats that some of our favorite heroes must overcome. So today, I have a topic that I've wanted to discuss for a long time now. How the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy perfected its villains. Now, I could just make a video on how scary these guys are, how much fun they all are, but I think that's a bit too easy. No. I would much rather discuss the hidden meaning behind what these characters represent within the larger story, and how they all reflect very human emotions and feelings, as well as how they act as perfect foils for each of the three main protagonists for the series. I will also discuss why the villains in the fourth and fifth films kind of fall flat in regards to any form of depth. With all that out of the way, let's jump right into it. To begin this analysis, I would love to start with the first protagonist the series had, Captain Hector Barbosa. The backstory for Barbosa given to us in Curse of the Black Pearl is a very simple one. He was the first mate of Captain Jack Sparrow, who after learning the location of some cursed Aztec gold, he staged a mutiny upon Jack. After marooning Jack on an island, Barbosa and the crew of the Black Pearl managed to find the gold, and they disregarded the myths and stole each gold coin and spent them on simple pleasantries of human life. Drink, food, pleasurable company, wink wink, etc. But the legends were true, and a curse was afflicted upon the pirates. They soon found that none of their urges could ever be satisfied. They became husks of who they once were, both in terms of their happiness, but also in terms of their physical appearance, as they would be turned into undead skeletons when under the glow of moonlight. And for a full decade, the Black Pearl would become a legend within the Caribbean Sea, one that would be known as the Scourge of the Seas. It would be known as a ship with black sails that's crewed by, by the, the dam. And captained by a man so evil that hell itself spat him back out. In regards to that comment about Barbosa, yeah, he really was a sickeningly evil character in the first film. The later films have Barbosa become less of an evil character, since his duty was to save piracy and free the sea goddess Calypso from a human form. But in the first film, he was cruel, deceitful, and flat out sadistic. Simply put, he is by no means a gentleman. When I think of Barbosa in this film, however, I think of something else entirely. I see a man who spent 10 years doing everything he could to correct for a mistake that destroyed his life. I see someone who sought the superficial aspects of life, the momentary emotional highs that could never truly be recaptured. Barbosa effectively went through a form of depression where nothing could ever truly satisfy the hole he had in his heart. This honestly reminds me of my favorite quote by George Lucas. If you get hung up on pleasure, you're doomed. If you pursue joy, you will find everlasting happiness. Barbosa lost sight of what truly makes life worth it. And that was a lesson that Jack Sparrow learned early on. Jack understands what true joy for a pirate is. Wherever we want to go, we can go. That's what a ship is, you know. It's not just a keel and a hole and a deck and sails. That's what a ship needs. But what a ship is, what the Black Pearl really is. Is freedom. What greater joy is there in a pirate's life to be free? Not to be bound by some wicked curse, but being out at sea, free as a bird, with a choice to go wherever you want. Freedom is a major theme in the series, so keep pinning that. In a sense, Barbosa's greatest rival, Jack Sparrow, is a man who truly saw what Barbosa could not. Jack does love a good drink, some decent food, and he loves pleasurable company, as we all know. But those come second for Jack. What Jack desires above all else is simply an adventure. After all, not all treasure is silver and gold. And this is why Barbosa and Jack make such great rivals. They are effectively the same. They have the same interests, the same beliefs, and they even share an obsession with captaining the Black Pearl. When they're not at each other's throats, they actually come off as like-minded friends. But what separates Jack from Barbosa, much like what separates heroes from villains in most stories, is an understanding of who they are and what they truly want above all else. This is where things get interesting, as Curse of the Black Pearl was originally designed to be a standalone film, so the wiggle room for making another villain was somewhat limited. 
How do you make another villain that could take the place of Barbosa without being a retread? Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio have a solution. Make a villain that explores a whole different emotion. Heartbreak. The backstory for Davy Jones, the villain of Dead Man's Chest and At World's End, is probably one of the saddest villain origin stories I've heard. To give a quick rundown, there was a Scottish sailor named Davy Jones, who above all else, loved the sea. Now for a sailor to love the sea, it's not at all uncommon. Freedom of exploration, a whole world of mysteries and stories to uncover, what is not to love? With Jones, however, it must have been very different. His love of sailing seemed to attract the attention of the sea goddess Calypso, the ruler of the seas. Now to attract the attention of a god, you must have some level of significance to your character. Jones and Calypso would fall in love, and Calypso would bestow upon the sailor the task of ferrying souls to regions beyond. He would do this task for 10 years, and after those 10 years, he could return to land and be with his love once again, rinse and repeat. Now that sounds like a really bad deal, but for a now immortal being like Jones, why not accept? That means he spends infinite decades sailing the seas, but with infinite days spent with his lover. Being the ferryman for lost souls for all eternity is not a half bad deal. However, after fulfilling his task after 10 whole years, he returned to land with Calypso nowhere to be found. Jones was heartbroken, believed that he had been betrayed, not understanding that Calypso is the physical embodiment of the sea itself, meaning she's just as predictable and wild as the waves across the world. Jones made a deal with the first Brethren Court of Pirate Lords to devise a plan to bind Calypso in human form, in which would result in the seas becoming the dominion of mankind. Davy Jones was overcome with guilt for hurting the love of his life, so he carved his heart out of his chest and buried it on the remote island of Isla Cruces, believing that this would dampen the emotional scarring he had caused for himself but also becoming the one weak spot for his now immortal being. Jones eventually went mad with his power, now being effectively a demigod who ruled the waves. He corrupted his purpose, and over time his physical image changed to resemble the monster he had become inside. He became a lumbering mass of sea life, consisting of various attributes that strike terror into the hearts of his victims. He would then find those who were dead or dying and offer them a place on his crew for 100 years to delay the inevitable end that we must all someday face. Little did these poor fools know that through the course of their servitude aboard the Flying Dutchman, they would not only become part of the crew, they would become part of the ship. As if the character of Davy Jones could not be more terrifying visually, he is made even more disturbing by his ship being made of the people he was originally tasked to help. To add to this horrific display, Jones became a sadist who takes pleasure in making innocent people fear for their lives. Being one of his crewmen is a century of torture, but before joining him, he will instill fear into the hearts of all who hear his name. So after that far more complex backstory than Barbosa, how do we have Jones represented in the film? How does he come into conflict with the protagonist? Well, in Curse of the Black Pearl, Barbosa is designed to be a rival for Jack Sparrow. And through both coming into contact with Jack and Will being the son of the pirate that had a connection to both Jack and Barbosa, and Elizabeth having stolen Will's medallion, all the characters were thrust into action. Barbosa became the antagonist for all of these characters through various means. And the same thing happens with Davy Jones. He struck a deal with Jack 13 years prior to be captain of the Black Pearl, and Jones is there to collect the debt of Jack's soul. Jack sends Will as an exchange for his own soul, and Will is forced into slavery aboard the ship. Will meets his father aboard the Dutchman and challenges Jones to a game of Liar's Dice. He then learns that the key to the dead man's chest, the chest in which Davy Jones put his heart, is kept on his person at all times. Will steals the key and escapes the Dutchman, only to be attacked by the Kraken, survive, and hitch a ride on the figurehead of the Flying Dutchman, where he arrives at Ila Cruces and reunites with Will and Jack, where he reveals that Jack tricked Will into joining the crew of the Dutchman on his behalf. Various antics ensue, and Norrington brings the heart of Davy Jones to Lord Cutler Beckett, who we will soon discuss in further detail. Jones then sends the Kraken to attack the Black Pearl, and Elizabeth is caught by Will kissing Jack, when in reality she was doing it to cuff Jack to his ship, since she understood the Kraken was only after him. Jack dies to the Kraken, and the Black Pearl is brought down to the depths, and the film ends on the cliffhanger of rescuing Jack from Davy Jones's locker. The interesting thematic parallels between Jones and Will are what I think best define him in his present state of living through these films. Think about it. Both Will and Jones were desperately in love with somebody, spent time in servitude doing whatever they could to reunite with their lover, 
that after going through all that time and effort for the woman they love, they came to some sort of false realization that they were betrayed. Much like the previous example, however, Jones lacks what Will has, the ability to fully understand what he wants and who he really is. Will was a childhood friend of Elizabeth's. Not only did he simply have a physical attraction to her, he genuinely cared about her well-being. Under no circumstance would Will ever hurt Elizabeth like Jones did with Calypso. And once Jones got a taste of cruel irony bestowed upon him, he decided to throw a temper tantrum that would cause the deaths of countless thousands of sailors. Will, on the other hand, would become the most noble pirate the Caribbean had ever seen, and eventually became the Dutchman captain himself, fulfilling the duty that Jones had neglected for all of these decades. But I'm getting ahead of myself, since that development happened in the third film. However, in that film, there is another villain that I think deserves a spotlight above all else. Lord Cutler Beckett. Cutler Beckett seemingly has less depth than the previous two villains on the face of it, but in truth, he is a villain who ties the whole trilogy together. Beckett is cold, calculating, generally unenthusiastic about most things. He does not have tendencies to share a hearty laugh with his crew like Barbosa. He does not cry in secret like Davy Jones. So what does Beckett have in terms of a memorable personality? He also does not have an extensive backstory in the films, aside from having extremely loose allusions to them. How do you know him? We've had dealings in the past, and we've each left our mark on the other. What mark did he leave on you? So what could I possibly glean from this character? What he represents, and I don't mean what he represents for just the characters as an antagonistic force, I mean the counterbalance to a free world being inhabited by free men and free women. Well, yes, the binding of Calypso did allow for the seas to be controlled by pirates, but also opened the floodgates to Beckett and his ilk. He's the lord of the East India Trading Company, which sought to have a stranglehold on trade across the seas, and had the backing of the British Royal Navy. If you dream of living in a free world, sailing the waves as a pirate, Beckett is the biggest threat to your existence. Not even the monstrous Davy Jones could be free under Beckett's reign of terror. The Dutchman sails as its captain commands. And its captain is to sail it as commanded. I would have thought you learned that when I ordered you to kill your pet. This is no longer your world, Jones. The immaterial has become immaterial. Hell, Beckett posed such a huge threat that Barbosa, the original villain of the series, was battling alongside the characters he nearly killed previously in the hopes of saving the pirate's life. And so far, I explain why each villain is a mirror of one of the series' protagonists. Barbosa is very similar to Jack, and was even his former first mate. Davy Jones' story mirrors that of Will Turner, and Will would go on to take his place as the captain of the Dutchman. Who does Beckett act as the foil for? Most would say Jack Sparrow, since Jack is the one who has an extensive history with Beckett. Yeah, Jack is kind of the star of the show for these movies, that would be too easy. No, the writers decided to make the bold choice of making Beckett the foil for Elizabeth Swan. Elizabeth, the young woman with a fascination in pirates and the daughter of the governor of Port Royal, to the damsel in distress, to a woman trying to save her husband from certain doom, to now being crowned the Pirate King. Jack may be the poster boy for a free spirit, but Elizabeth would sooner be sent to a watery grave, defending freedom, than to ever return to her previous life. And to make things even more personal, he instructed the assassination of Elizabeth's father after he was becoming a potential threat to Beckett's plans. Beckett's one and only goal was to simply bend the forces of nature to his will, to rule the seas with an iron fist. He is truly a proverbial Emperor Palpatine for the story. Trust me, I will make a video on why Elizabeth is a fantastic character at a later date, but for the context of understanding what Beckett's purpose for existing in this series is, she's also very worth discussing. Also, while I generally do not use external media to explain things in a film, I do find it interesting how Beckett's backstory outside of the films has him kidnapped by pirates, but this developed into a hatred of piracy. Elizabeth, on the other hand, was captured by pirates, but her fascination with them helped her become the most formidable pirate ever to sail the seas. So while he may be a less popular villain than the likes of Davy Jones and Barbosa, I would argue that Beckett truly is a well-written and incredibly solid addition to this universe. Now the same cannot be said for the fourth and fifth films, unfortunately. I will keep this very brief, since this is supposed to be a positive video about the series, but I do need to talk about these characters since this is a video on the series as a whole. First, we have Blackbeard. How do you get more classic than Blackbeard? He's the pirate that all pirates feared, 
His name is known by virtually everyone in the modern age. When people think of pirates, they think of Blackbeard. So how was he handled in the Pirates of the Caribbean universe film, On Stranger Tides? Well, not great. Not to say that he was terrible by any means. In fact, he had an incredible performance from Ian McShane. However, there was nothing in the vein of depth for him. He's not a heartbroken man who felt betrayed by the love of his life, nor is he a depressed man who is desperate to feel something again. The one-note evildoer works best if they have a more complex villain to bounce off of. Think of how Davy Jones was effectively the puppet for Beckett through all of Outworld's End. That is a dynamic that allows for the emotional depth to be carried in full by one character and to have the other acting as a foil. Meanwhile here, there's nothing of the sort. In the fifth and final film, Dead Men Tell No Tales, it suffers from the same issue, among other things. Salazar, probably the most one note out of all these villains, is a cool design and a cool performance, but that's about it. It also does not help that part of his flashback origin story caused a gaping issue in continuity for the series, but I digress. All Salazar has for a backstory is that he was a pirate hunter who was killed in action by Jack Sparrow tricking him. This is fine enough, but why does he hate pirates so much? Why is this a personal thing for him? Again, Beckett and Davy Jones have each other to bounce off of, but Salazar has nothing. Davy Jones had a tragic backstory and mirrored the protagonist. Barbosa was an old friend of Jack's who betrayed him. Salazar has nothing. Sadly, that was the last of the villains for the series. Well, it had two lackluster villains. The original trilogy films had some of the best villains I have seen in fiction. I'm honestly surprised that so few villains are written like the ones in Pirates of the Caribbean. The insane Barbosa, the heartless Davy Jones, and the manipulating Beckett are all such stellar villains that I can say truly made these already great films into near masterpieces. Thank you so much for watching. Please, if you like this video, give it a like, subscribe, comment down below your thoughts on these villains. Also, if you'd like, join my Discord server and follow me on Twitter. Both links will be in the description. Until next time, have a great day.